history as St. Barnabas become the first team made up of all American born players to win the New York Senior Football Championship. I review what was a thrilling game at Gaelic Park last Sunday with Frank Brady and we discuss what it means for the local Woodlaw and Barnabas community and the wider New York GAA community as a whole. This is a jam-packed podcast featuring post-match interviews with St. Barnabas manager Johnny McGinney, St. Barnabas chairman and selector Mike Brosnan, as well as winning team captain Connor Rafferty. New York County Board Chairperson Joan Henchy gives us her thoughts on the win, and we also look back on the Senior Hurling Championship Final, where Hoboken guards clinched a historic three in a row. Hoboken player and selector Paul dumper Lucknan speaks to us about that achievement, and we also discuss Ulster's win in the Junior A Hurling Final, and the remaining games on the New York calendar, including the Junior A and B Finals, as well as the Ladies Football Championship. So Frank Brady is back on the Long Haul Podcast again this week. Frank, thanks very much. You were hard to come by this week. You were just up refereeing in the Rockland County there, you said. So you're, you're, full, you're full steam this week. But uh, we were along, alongside each other for the most part of last Sunday up in the press box in Gator Park. And what a day of action we had. Absolutely. It was an incredible comeback. And the victory was all the more astonishing given the fact uh, that Barnabas trailed by 10 points going into the last quarter and that they were able to eliminate that 10 points and eventually win by four. As I said before, it was a most historic occasion and I've been involved in a lot of finals in New York over the years managing teams and but I have never been as happy or as excited with that results. I think it does absolutely wonders for the uh, underage programs in New York here and to show that we have got an awful lot of talent in New York we just got to have to promote it and develop it, continue to do that. Yeah, so Frank, you've, got a, you've been immersed in St. Barnabas for many a year. Um, you've been involved managing, you played with them. Tell me how much it means to the community up there and give us a quick uh, background on the Barnabas Club. They were formed in 1972, I believe. Yes, the, the, the club uh, was formed in 72. And uh, one of the original founders was in the park last Sunday and his two grandsons were starring for St. Barnabas, that's the Hogan brothers. Uh, now, uh, when they started first, they had no facility or no place and uh, the late Paddy Markham managed to persuade the city to turn over that piece of ground uh, that's now known as, as Paddy's Field. And uh, that became a critical part of the community. And one of the things that stands out about St. Barnabas is the great family orientation that the club has. And it was very obvious yesterday evening uh, they, they had a meet and greet in Paddy's Field and uh, it was amazing to see all the number of young players that were uh, practicing and training up there, all being coached by former players, uh, fellas like Kevin Lilly, Kenny O'Connor, uh, Murray uh, that used to play uh, with New York and uh, they were delighted to meet the um, New York champions. And uh, Mike Brosnan, you know, is a man of a few words, but usually very well chosen ones. And he said one of the things that he would love these young fellas to take away from this was, you know, based on what they saw last Sunday, never give up, nine, ten points down. Most people would have written off uh, New York and figured that Sligo, sorry, not New York, St. Barnabas, and that Sligo would be get over the line. And the resolve and the resilience to bounce back from that deficit was, abs- was absolutely incredible. And the, the St. Barnabas area is booming uh, as a result of this victory. And I think it sets the scene for plenty more down the line. So does St. Barnabas are from that area there in the, just on the border? It's, it's kind of like the juxtaposition of Katona and McLean Avenue. And uh, the St. Barnabas Church is, is right in the, in the middle there. And there, there's tremendous loyalty uh, in this area. Uh, many of the players that were, were playing uh, on Sunday, uh, their, their fathers uh, would have played uh, with St. Barnabas uh, along the way. And one of the great things to see Mike Brosnan, you know, Mike Kerryman played with Leitrim here. Now he's, he's the chairman of the Barnabas Club and he's vice chairman of the New York Minor Board. Uh, but to see his two sons uh, play for St. Barnabas. Mike Kennedy was a great hurler in his day. To see Giroud and as I mentioned the Hogans and when you look at the team I think there are about players from about five or six different families on the team so that kind of gives you the idea of how close-knit uh, this group is and the loyalty that they have to the St. Barnabas uh, team. 
Yeah, so Frank, it was, uh, of course, this year we didn't have any summer sanctions. It was a, kind of a depleted championship, but it still it highlighted the fact that the talent is here, the homegrown talent is here, and Sligo were the champions last year, and this All-American team were able to beat uh, a team with several inter-county players. So it just, just shows you that the standard was there, the talent was there, the skill was there, that they can compete at the top level. Yes, I think there is a very valuable lesson here. I, I think over, over the years, we have not appreciated fully our homegrown talent here. And uh, it's like a pipeline. Uh, we depend on some of these summer players, the sanctions and the students. And in many cases, the native born player has to play second fiddle when these arrive. But I think this sends a very, very clear message that we have plenty of talent here. I think the one big challenge down the road is that we can find the proper structures uh, to continue to develop these people. Because if you look at their counterparts in Ireland, you know they're all, they're all playing club football throughout the year. They're playing with the colleges, and, the, and especially in higher education and third level education. And here we don't have as many opportunities. I know it's great in recent years that they've got into the British universities competition and into, the, and into the trench cup. But I think we need more of those type of competitions if we are to continue to develop uh, adequate number of American born players and hence lessen uh, the reliance depending on these summer players uh, because many, many of these have a very limited loyalty and invariably you find some of them that uh, they have to go back to repeat exams and uh, they involved considerable expenses for the clubs. And as I said in the paper, this was the first time ever that a New York Senior Football Championship was won without having to pay for an airfare. Somebody did say <laughs> one of the players ha had to get uh, money for tokens, but that's another story. Some by tokens. I read that. I read that in your piece, Frank. <laughs> Very true, very true. And that, I suppose that is a, a, a debate maybe for another day, but there is a lot of money pumped into the senior championship here. And, uh, you know, it's just pumped in for the summer and there is a high turnover. And I, I have an interview with Joan coming up later on in the podcast and she, she knows that. And she was a secretary for the last couple of years and there was a big effort in the last couple of years to, you know, to focus on the homegrown talent, to develop the homegrown talent and ultimately get that New York inter-county team with, with far more home-based teams. Therefore, you're not relying every year on a new squad and you can build from, yeah. from here be, with your homegrown players. Be, beside the, besides the St. Barnabas uh, club, there are also a few other clubs that seem to be following very, very much in their footsteps, and that will be Shannon Gales. Uh, and interestingly, uh, St. Barnabas availed of a couple of Shannon Gales players. And uh, they, are, they are going to be in the final, well, they are in the final of the Junior B and uh, I predict that they will win. And I can see them eventually uh, aspiring to be where St. Barnabas are today. And if you also look at the Rangers, Rangers came up from intermediate last year and uh, they're senior this year, but they've got uh, one of the few clubs that have three teams and there's some very, very talented players coming through at the moment that are currently lining out for their B division. And I think down the road a little bit, uh, when you look at players like the McGilligan brothers, uh, Paddy Mulvihilson, Paddy has done an incredible job coaching these players over the years. So I think you'll see more teams uh, solidly backed by American-born players. And Frank, the, so Shannon Gales, they're, of course, the Matter brothers who are playing, uh, are playing with Shannon Gales. And of course, Tiernan, who was, I know you didn't pick man of the match, but for someone to kick 3-3 three, three in, a, in a county final is, is some achievement. Tiernan is, is involved with Shannon Gales and they're Queens based, aren't they? And so the Rangers are the other team. Where, where, where are Rangers uh, based? Uh, Rangers Ranger are just basically based in the Bronx, the North, the North Bronx too. But the other thing about the Shannon Gales is, is the family concept. If you look at their, there are five Mathers brothers there and there are the two Devlin brothers and they are, they are sons of a man that was known as Duke Devlin years ago, a great player in, in Gaelic Park and did an awful lot in promoting football with the Tyrone Club over the years. And you, you have uh, a son of Brefney, uh, Brefney Smith, uh, you, you have Duggan, you have a whole slew of young fellas that have come up through from under 10s all the way up. And right now they're about breaking through into the adult level.
And of course, the, the game was live streamed on Facebook, Frank. The three games were live streamed on Facebook. It was a great, it, it was a great way of advertising the game here because there was people from from all over the world watching the game. It was a, it was it, it was it was a great um, service to put on for for spectators who couldn't get to the to the ground. Absolutely, I got a couple of phone calls immediately afterwards, and I was also told that RTE, it was part of their broadcast, the fact that this St Barnabas team had won which was absolutely incredible because it has never happened uh, before that an All-American born team would lift the, uh, as I said, the biggest prize in, in the GA scene in New York football. You know, so. Yeah. so just going into the, the actual game itself, Frank, um, like um, Barron was probably, in my opinion, they were kind of in control there for much of the first half, the first maybe 20, 25 minutes, they went 8-6 ahead uh, and then probably maybe against the run of play they got a bit of a fortuitous goal a long ball went in Johnny Glynn knocked it down and uh, Sligo pull, pull, uh, poked the goal out of it they got a we went two points up before half time and then they got two uh, at uh, after half time um, I think Tiernan pulled it, pulled it back again but off Sligo went Sligo powered ahead they got two goals and four points they were ten points up going into the last quarter and Barnabas came over to our side here and you you, I think you, I think you might have called it, Frank. You said it was all over, but uh, the lads, did, and I think everyone thought it was all over. But the lads didn't hold back; they went back out, and well, it, it was like it was like Sligo were maybe a man or two men down. I've never seen a team so fit, powering through on the overlap. They just never gave up. Gave up. They eventually got a goal, knocked on a couple of points, and eventually pulled it back to a draw. It was some spectacle. Yes, it was. And uh, yes, I, I will admit that I had a moment of doubt. But <laughs> that moment of doubt was eliminated very quickly when Gerard Kennedy, Kennedy took the penalty and he sent the keeper the wrong way. And the response from the stands was unbelievable. And uh, that certainly got them invigorated. And it's an incredibly skillful team and the support that they give each other. And I knew that as the game wore on, that that fitness and skill would become more to, to uh, St. Barnabas' benefit. And that's exactly what happened. And they kept their composure. They never panicked. And when the when they 45 arrived from out on the left side, I, I knew that Sean Riley would not ha- have the distance. But the boys, uh, I think it was Tiernan Matters again, just got, into this, got, got, got in front of the goals and got a flick and got it over. And once it went to overtime, I felt that uh, St. Barnabas would have it based on their superior fitness and great support play. And they're a very strong team from number one to number 20 or 25. Yeah, the, it was the last minute that 45 sailed in. And tear no matter, he just ju- jumped up into the air uh, and fisted it over the bar. It was quite a score. It, cer- was- it certainly was. It certainly was. So. And, and I, I, I think that was the... The fact that uh, St. Barnabas had come back and levelled, I think their confidence level rose considerably going into extra time. Yeah, and of course, it was towards the end of the f- first half of extra time where Tiernan got two goals within the space of 30 seconds. <laughs> that second goal was a thing of beauty. Ab- ab- absolutely. The, the, uh, the incredible composure that he had and the, w- the way that he judged the, the chipping the keeper to a tee was, was, was absolute perfection. Yeah, and it was no 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 ordinary keeper. It was Vinnie Cadden, who was is one of the one of the top goalkeepers around. He's in goal for the for the New York uh, senior team, and uh, he's the former Sligo goalkeeper as well. Yeah. He's the county goalkeeper. So, and it just and I think I think I think they, when you put the the St Barnabas performance into perspective, that they beat a very very good team, hmm. not just due to the fact that Sligo had four or five former inter county players, but all those players throughout the field would be highly regarded and, uh, you know, very competent, skilled players in their own way. And the fact that St. Barnabas were able to beat that team fair and square, I, I think is a massive achievement uh, for the club. Yeah, there was, of course, uh, Peter Cook was there. There was the, the, the two Glens, uh, Daniel yeah. Yankee, Mc, Mc, McKenna, McKenna, Tony yes. Donnelly. There was, you know, they had a star-studded team, really, when you think about it. And it just, uh, just yeah. underscores the achievement I, I think that one major major factor uh, in the in the comeback or the revival was the the, the way that uh, St Barnabas broke the ball in in the middle of the field, especially Shane Hogan uh, began to break the ball very effectively, 
and uh, St. Barnabas uh, players were, were picking up the brakes and going right on the attack. I think that was a major, a major role. He positioned himself extremely well. And I think they got the matchups uh, extremely yeah. well too, uh, apart from uh, Niall Murphy, uh, who did get a bit of liberty all right. But most of the other players were very well contained and were, were not able to get uh, uncontested shots off for most of the game. Yeah, the midfield was a big factor, and of course Brian Glynn, who had played in the, who captained Hoboken in the the, the previous game, only about an hour beforehand, uh, went off injured early on, and his brother Johnny, who was a full forward, uh, he was telling me that he was carrying an injury, so maybe uh, well, luck was on their side as well. But uh, <laughs> speaking of carrying something, Peter Hatzer was coming from that final as well, but he was carrying a, a New York Senior Hurling Championship <laughs> medal with him. And uh, I, I spoke to Peter last yeah. night, yesterday evening, up on Paddy's Field, and I says, uh, we have to see about altering your birth cert because you're <laughs> upsetting the narrative a little bit here with this being an All-American-born team. But Peter didn't start, so it's still an All-American-born exactly. team. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Peter Hatzer came on, I think, after about five minutes. Uh, I think they couldn't have started him or else we would have been factually incorrect. But it was an All-American. No, no, there was an injury. There, there, was, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was an injury. Francis, Francis Cole was injured, so he came on to replace yeah. Francis Cole. So... So a very like, things are looking bright on the the football uh, side. So Frank, hopefully we can we'll see a lot of these players now next year. Uh, God willing that the the intercounty season will go ahead and we'll get a return fixture back in May or something that we'll see a lot of these lads with the with the New York team. I know a lot more of them were involved this year, and unfortunately the game went early on. So looking looking up for New York uh, football. Yes, I. I think it would be a major asset going going forward and that people will, will realize we do have plenty of talent here. We just got to have to continue uh, to, to promote it. And as I said, I'm expecting uh, to see some of these other uh, to Rangers to stay up and continue to improve and Shannon Gales eventually to make their way up to senior football and uh, contribute plenty of players uh, to the New York team. And uh, that, hence lessen our reliance on bringing out players and looking for players. And I think it will stand to the clubs because it will reduce their expenses considerably and the, uh, Im- improve the general atmosphere in the club. In other words, the club will be based here and people will feel loyalty and attachment to it, just like the players do to St. Barnabas yeah. and Shannon Gales and that they're, they're not uh, you know, just uh, switching around from club to club. I spoke to St. Barnabas captain Conor Rafferty after the game, followed by county chairperson Joan Henchy. But that was after I pulled St. Barnabas manager Johnny McGinney and chairman and selector Mike Brosnan aside. I asked Mike if he had given up hope going into the last quarter being 10 points down. Yeah, we were down 10. I mean, we had um, we, we got the water break and we brought the boys in together and Johnny had a, a fierce chat with him and we emphasised that, listen lads, this game is not over yet. We knew we, knew we had the legs today to win this and to come from 10 points down, listen, we needed a goal to get back in with and we got it straight away and I think uh, from there on we took it from there. And... I mean, there's great credit due to what Johnny did here with these lads. I mean, over the last few years, we knew these lads were coming up for a long time. Johnny came on board a couple of years ago and gave them a, a different sense of belief that they can actually win this thing. And believe you me, there's a serious bunch of players there. But uh, there's great credit due to Johnny as well for the work that he's done with him. So, Johnny, tell me about the, the road to the final last week. Was um, was kind of uh, it went extra time, obviously, and then to get a second chance. And some people might have thought that the experience would stand to Sligo more. Yeah, we, we, we definitely thought we thought that, but you know we've been training. We we've since since Brazzy gave us the keys at Paddy's Field, we've been training, and we knew we knew with the whole COVID rules and everything that was going on, it was going to be a big impact with the home base. So we, we looked at that and and we attacked it, and we you know we've brought junior players on to senior that you know we we knew could play and and have the ability to play, and we just had the numbers at every training. We you know. We got a lot of game time, and I, I believe that the extra game suited us. Game time suits us, and like you can see there, we've, we've 20, 25 athletes, you know, and it's the never, the never day. We, we even said at 10, 11 points up, don't give up, don't stop, don't stop, because I know it's hard in Sligo, but they didn't have the legs, because I don't know if they're, you know, getting the training. They've been, they've been the team to look at this three or four years, and so I, I'd be great mates with Johnny Glynn, and you know, it's the banter between, it, it's great, so it's just, it's great, it's great for the boys to win it, and the same, like, 
this is a thing, this is going on this five, six years, and I, I've been with the college, I've been lucky enough, Brad's brought me into the college to fail it, so I, I got my eyes open to, what, to what's there, and it, the likes of Glenn, I've, you know, brought in, trying to get him to buy into it, and he's great, he's been great with me, with, you know, training the young fellas and all, so... Listen, it's just, this is what Brazzy has brought up this 10, 15 years. His two sons played there. His son was playing Junior B last week. Myself and himself in an argument last week. I wanted to bring his son in. Now he's a senior medal. He's 17 years of age. Mike, tell me about, uh, you came over here, of course, you were one of the most... Uh, one of the best players to grace Gaelic Park in the 90s and just for your son was playing today and just for an All-American history was made today what does it like taught me through the last 20, 30 years of being out here and what it means then to to make history today the crowd was just up up in the air it was a very tense game what does it mean to the local community up in St Barnabas and of course the wider region there's a few lads from uh, from uh, Shannon Gales playing as well Yeah and a few lads from upstate I mean it's been absolutely brilliant over the last 30 years I can tell you I've played I've played in a few of these games myself but nothing compared to what happened here today I mean for these lads to get an opportunity to win a New York championship as a totally American team I've been looking at it for since the boys were seven eight years of age and they've come up through the ranks and we knew they were coming we knew we had a good bunch of players and we knew at some stage that we'd get them all together and we'd win a New York championship. I mean, again, I can't thank Johnny enough for what he has done. And listen, there's great credit due to Sligo as well. I mean, listen, they beat us we, by two points the first game of the year. And I had a conversation with them over there, you know, that we needed to get to where they are. And I think we did that, you know, through training above and Paddy's field. Like, championships are won, you know, it's on the training field. And above and Paddy's field, like, there was nights, Johnny, we had 30, over 30 lads. We wouldn't have enough bibs for them some nights, you know. But And, and there was nights that the, the second team went out and beat the first team. So, you know, the, the competitiveness was unbelievable and it all came to a, a peak today. So, Just tell me how hard it is for a group of American kids to, to go on and hit that 19, 20-year-old age and stay with the football because, of course, a lot of them go to university. They'd go, they'd go away to college. There's other sports, probably these, these are all fine athletes, there's scholarships involved, like how hard is it, you know, just to maintain that core group of players? It's definitely tough, it's definitely tough. Um, they do have college and obviously education comes first, you know, so, uh, but this bunch of lads, some of them are coming back from college, you know, and they've stayed with it, they've stuck with it, and they come back from college whenever they're asked, and they've been absolutely brilliant, you know, for the... 100% of the time, it, they've been brilliant and uh, it is tough for I know but uh, these bunch of lads have bought into it and there's, listen, there's more lads coming behind us, I mean there's another team, Rangers are back in the in the senior division this year for the first time uh, another Irish-American team and Shannon Gales, another young Irish-American team coming so this is only the start of it but I think we needed to win this today to make a statement for these lads and for the younger lads that's coming up behind them I think it's going to be it's going to be huge for New York GA to have a, a big input of Irish American players playing here in Gaelic Park now. Just going back to the game, Jad, there was, of course, the 10 points. Did you think it was did you think it was all over? And just come, t t taught me through the comeback. And there was, it looked like Sligo had a couple of men down. There was just waves, even in the last quarter when you, when you thought, when many thought it was all over. They were, your lads just kept going, kept going. The fitness, fitness speed experience eventually in the end today. Yeah, well, I always, I always say if, if Mike Brosnan and Tiana Manners have space in there, you never know what's going to happen. But the belief in the young boys, you know, it's it's something else. They were playing here last night at 6 o'clock as we're Schlegel and they stayed on for the 60 minutes and I was over there on the sideline was trying to call them off. They just The energy they have, they just never give up. It's, I don't know if it's an ignorance or what it is that they got from the Irish side, but they just they never give up. They never give up. And you seen what happened. Thanks a million, lads. Appreciate it. So I'm here with Conor Rafferty, the um, captain of the Victoria St. Barnabas team who have made history today, the first All-American team to win the New York County Championship. Conor, tell me, how does it feel? 
This is an unbelievable feeling. You know, majority of us have been playing with this club since we were six, seven years of age, predominantly an American club. And to come up to the senior level just a couple years back and be able to now win the actual senior championship is absolutely unbelievable. It's a feeling that we'll remember forever and we, we look forward to keeping going with this momentum and keep pushing forward and, and keep it going. Tell me about your own background and your own Irish roots and what it means to you on a personal level to, uh, to win today. Yeah, so my mother's from Crossline and Mayo, my father's from Carrickmore, Tyrone, so obviously deep football roots there, so it's been engraved into our minds, both myself and my two brothers, Kevin and Shane, who play alongside me on the team. Uh, it's, it's just been a way of life, you know, since we've been playing here in New York, and, and, and it's fantastic to see now the Irish, young Irish Americans coming up and be able to perform with the likes of county players who were, who were on the Sligo side. It was, it was really a great performance by all of us today. Uh, tell me what it means for the look, the, the the community. You're all like it's the Woodlawn kind of Yonkers area. There, there's a few. The Matters lads are out in Queens, out in Shannon Gales. But what does it mean for the local community here in New York, New York City? I suppose. Well, it's great coming forward now. We have four sets of brothers on the team, and every single one of us have younger brothers coming up, coming up. They're all coming up through the ranks, and it's really great to see. Now, even training for the New York Senior Panel, you have a load of Irish Americans coming on now and being able to train and be able to compete. And even at the Fela level, you have guys coming in, even at the minor level, uh, competing high over in Ireland, both here as well. So it's, it's really great to see, and for the whole community as well. It gives that boost. We have a strong upcoming here, and it's, it's really great to see the New York GAA, the, the senior board, the minor board, they're doing a fantastic job with, with really keeping, keeping football and even hurling, camogie, all moving forward here. So it's great to see. Getting back to the game, it was a draw last weekend, went, sec went extra time. Today, you were 10 points down going into the final quarter. Many people thought it was done and dusted. What was said during that water break just before the last 15? Yeah, what a water break that was. We went down by 10 points and it was two unlucky goals. You know, it was, it was a mistake in the back line and then you know we were always playing catch up from then but that water break we just said to ourselves we came this far we've worked hard we're fit we're well able for them and we we felt we were strong enough to come back and we just kept that mentality going and right from that throw in after the water break we just kept going and pushing forward and you know we started popping them over we got that goal we got the second goal then and the crowd was behind us so that was great to see there was a big fan base here today and they obviously pushed us forward as well so it was a fantastic comeback and even an extra time then it was it was was unbelievable and we we got it done you never did you take the rules gone or did you you never stop believing you know when when you go down 10 points 15 minutes to go it's 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 hard to say you know you can't say it's over because the final whistle hasn't gone but you know we we believed in ourselves and we were able to come out strong get the job done and it's it's something we'll we'll remember forever thanks a million so i'm here with john Henchy, the new york county chair after St. Barnabas made history, being the first All-American team to win the New York Senior Football County Championship. Joan, tell me what it means to the community for yourself, uh, the work you've done with the development teams all through the years, and tell me about this team that have come up and, against all odds, beaten the reigning champions. I, I mean, ultimately, it is an absolutely historic day for everybody in the New York GA. Um, a lot of work has gone in behind the scenes, and obviously it's come to fruition today between our development squads. But I mean, it started at minor board level and up through CYC and Fela's and all the other competitions, and then by the time they came across to us. So um, our development squads have been very successful, and this is proof of the pudding that, you know, hard work pays off. Um, history was made. They were an all-American team, all home base, no sanctions. Um, and it also just shows that we're quite capable of uh, competing in New York without sanctions and transfers or, you know, importing. Um, we do have the talent here at home. Yeah. So it was a baptism of fire for you being the, the county chair this year. Uh, the, the, obviously the inter-county game went at the start of the year. There was New York, of course, was the epicentre of the coronavirus. To even to get championship played off was some feat by yourself and the county board. And what a feast of GA action we've had in the last two weeks. We also had the, the hurling final beforehand. We also had the hurling final where Hoboken completed three in a row. That was historic. Um, tell me about the, the year that, Scott, that, you, that you've had. Uh, where do you start? Um, I mean, needless to say, I mean, you know, getting a phone call uh, on March 12th and telling, you know, we had to shut down um, before even the lockdown came. And then ultimately, you know, the next call was um, we were the first victim of the inter-county um, championship, which, I mean, it was understandable. We were part of the epicentre, but to be very honest with you, um, 
and if you had asked me in April, I didn't think we were going to be able to do this, but we kept at it and we kept looking at the numbers and we put a plan in place and we did rollouts and how it was going to look um, and we looked for the appetite and see if the appetite was there from the players and the clubs if they wanted to play and thankfully they did and they dug deep. Um, they dug deep and it was... And what we've accomplished as a board is is astounding considering the amount of games we played in such a short space of time. We were doing 16 games a week and thank God we've had no case. Um, so and there's a lot of positives to take out of this year even though there was a lot of hardship through the year as well, not just, uh, just entire GEA community as a whole. I mean, with the lockdown, we had so many people hurting um, during that lockdown with no finances and stuff coming in. So this association can be very proud of itself. Yeah. And of course, uh, you were heavily involved with Sly into 2020, you know, fundraising for people who would have been out of work. Uh, tell me about that. Um, that was... Um, that was an emotional roller coaster. That that was very difficult at times. Um, being on that committee, we raised over one hundred and sixty thousand um, dollars in three and a half months, and that money went directly to paying bills, rent, and basically just digging people out and giving them a lifeline and knowing that we were there and that they weren't alone. Uh, just getting back to the game today. Did you think Barnabas it was all, it was all I, like? It, Every, as the county chair, obviously you tried to be neutral, but I think everyone here wanted uh, Barnabas to, to clinch that first first title. Yeah, I, I, I suppose. Look, I mean, uh, ultimately, you know, as I have to be neutral, but I mean, Sligo are an outstanding uh, club, and they have always been an outstanding club. Um, but yeah, it, it, to see these young American kids come up through the ranks, and you know, it just validates what we're doing um, and how important it is to focus. You give them the tools, and you give them the opportunities; they'll come. They'll come. They love it. They absolutely love it. They eat and die for this game and it was never more evident than it was. They were down by 10 points with, what, 10 minutes left in the game? They were 10 points down going into the final quarter. There you go. So, you know, it just goes to show, like, you know, they were able to do it. And, um, you know, there's a credit to everybody involved in getting that. And they're the, they're the first senior team. However, we're seeing it at every level and in, in every single aspect of the organization. Limerick put out a junior hurling team this year, 95% of them were American born kids, um, which is huge. Ulster today had two or three young American kids starting and played the entire game, uh, go on to win a, a title as well. So, you know, there's a lot of, the hard work is starting to show and it's important that we just grow from here. So you, we've spoken before and you said the ultimate goal is to get more of a home, homegrown inter-county football team. Like, how big of a push was it today? How big of a, of a motivational factor was it today? I saw all all the young kids r r running on there and all, I hear all the American accents I've been at county finals through, uh, uh, back home in Ireland and I listen to the, the accents, it's quite different but you can see the what it means to the youngsters here. You know look at, I mean from a county perspective we have to take a look at the bigger picture here because the turnover of players is is, is ridiculous, um, you know for us to sustain ourselves and to, to actually be competitive we need to be looking at having um, a home-based team and uh, the same as any other county with minimal turnover or you know very small percentage of turnover um, so you know when Joan was screaming at everybody that this needed to be done a few years ago they all thought I was nuts but I think they'll all figure out now that you know we do have we do have a plan and I mean the kids they have I keep calling them kids they'll be 50 and I'll be still calling them kids um, the talent is there we know the talent is there and we've it wasn't even a matter of unearthing it, it was introducing it and, and showing you know, clubs that these young men and girls um, are here and that they need to utilise them. And if anything comes out of what we've been through this year is the importance of having that home base and how important it is to have a home base club. Uh, they're not just your club, they're your family. Um, you know, so it, it, there's a lot to take away from it. But yeah, I mean, it's a, a, an unbelievable day for, for football in New York. Yeah, the sanctions have always been, have always you know, brightened up Gaelic Park through the years that the summer sanctions will come in. Of course, this year, no, they weren't here, but it gives uh, fellas who are living here, you know, that, that opportunity to, you know, to, to train away and knowing that there's not a, like a sanction coming in and perhaps, you know, putting, taking their place or something like that. I don't think I've ever seen an inter, I don't think I've ever seen a senior county final played at the standard and the level that they've played in the last two Sundays. Um, I don't think a sanction I w would possibly have ruined it. 
um, and that's to be fair. I think we have to take a good, long, hard look at our own sustainability. Um, you know, sanctions are great, and I'm not knocking it um, by any means. But I think clubs can take a lot away from it this year. The financial, you know, the financial costs um, and stuff, because we don't know where we're going. When is the next dinner dance? When is the next fundraiser? When is, you know, when can we all get together in an indoor space again? We don't know what's happening. So we really do need to start looking at, you know, what's best for New York at this stage. Just finally, ground was broken on the, the, the clubhouse behind us just before COVID. So I suppose everything is on is on hold now in, in terms of the clubhouse, is it? Uh, no, um, it is and it isn't. We Obviously, we got shut down with, with during the shutdown. And then obviously, um, Dublin were concerned about any capital projects and stuff, and rightfully so. Um, so we just had to resubmit our, our financial plan and how we're raising the money and stuff. And then once they just sign on it and give us the all clear, we're good to go. So we're hoping in the next couple of weeks to actually start because we really do need to get that opened. I mean, um, I don't know if anybody's seen the, the, the plans on that. It's online and they should because it's kind of like an indoor, outdoor space and with everything that's going on, it'll be absolutely amazing to be able to have that and be able to sit outside and have that whole indoor, outdoor space. We turn our attention to the hurling finals now and this includes an interview with Paul dumper Lochnan. Okay, Frank, and so of course, uh, before that game was the... Uh, the senior hurling final and that in itself was historic that was a real cracker of a game uh, Hoboken just edged young Tipperary by two goals and 22 points and two goals and 19 points by a goal at the end Hoboken yep. achieves history three in a row um, a great game Yes, absolutely. And I will admit that I had a moment of doubt in this game too that Hoboken would not get to three in a row and that was based on when Paul Gordon left the field because I've seen Paul Gordon in a number of games this summer and he's an absolutely incredible athlete that can get scores from all sorts of angles. When I saw him lifting, limping off, I thought there, there goes their chance. Mm. But then I thought what was, was amazing, he was thrown back into the fray with a couple of minutes left and he was hobbling very badly. The first ball that came his way, he couldn't get to it. But the second one he did, and he got a very neat, deft touch to it, right into the path of, I think, Dara, Dara Walsh. And he certainly made no mistake, a native of Ennis. And he ended up with a, a very impressive personal tally of two goals and nine points and gave an absolutely splendid performance. But as I said, Paul Gordon, though a wounded warrior, still contributed mightily, even though he was basically on one leg at the end of that game. Yeah, we were looking at each other. We were thinking, what is going on here? Yes. He, he couldn't move, but you could see just the physical presence alone was having an impact. And of course, that flick cha really changed the game. Flicked it onto Darrell Absolutely, that was, that, was, that was the clincher. That, that was the clincher because once the ball was in the net, I think the game was basically over. But having looked at all the finals so far this year, they have all been absolutely incredible. Uh, I, I think this is the best year that I have seen in terms of matchups and close finals, in, entertaining, exciting, exhilarating stuff. It's been been absolutely brilliant summer for New York G in particular here. Yeah, and the hurling you were saying, the hurling has been very successful this year as well. Frank hasn't. It's been very competitive. Michael Sheedy, of course, is on the Tipperary side. There got twelve points. Dara Wadge two nine. But uh, these uh, a lot of the teams have played each other already in the season, hadn't they? Yes, and. Uh, there was little more than a puck of the ball between any of these uh, teams that were competing at senior level this year. So it definitely set the scene for a very competitive uh, New York senior hurling uh, final. Yeah. And of course, uh, of course we, we had a famine at the start of the year, but we've had a feast the last couple of weeks, Frank. And before that senior hurling final, there was the junior hurling final. Another close encounter where Ulster just edged out Westmead in the final. Yes, yes. And that went down to the wire uh, to a breaking ball. I think it was Stephen McAfee that latched onto it. And he's a, a powerfully built, sturdy centre half back. And once he got possession, I said, here goes, took a couple of steps and he let fly from about 25 yards. And that was the clincher. Uh, that that goal in the in the dying moments of that game is also in, interesting that he was the uh, he got the opening score in the game as well. So uh, it was great to see uh, some very young players on that Ulster team. Uh, be, besides the, uh, uh, the the veterans such such as uh, McFatteridge, uh, Lorcan Kennedy, very young player, very very skillful. Uh, that his level of skill definitely belies his years, and uh, I look forward to seeing much more of him as he grows uh, down the road. Uh, but also, uh, Ulster had some very powerful finishers, especially in Conor O'Kane. He ended up with 110 
and uh, got good support from fellas like Eamon, Eamon Brennan and Trevor Fallon. And uh, Ulster used to be a senior team and uh, Ulster's might was right on the day and I think they're back in the rightful position as a senior hurling club and I think they'll go from strength to strength uh, when, they, when, they get, when they go back up there. Okay. And I think there was a red card flash in that game as well. Frank was there, so it was a bit. Uh, it was a real uh, feisty affair. Yeah, but on the and in fairness, in fairness to, yes, it was a feisty game, but it was quite a clean game overall. Uh, of course, Jeremy Parkland was the chief weapon that Westmead had, and he scored one six. He, he scored, uh, I don't know, was it three fourteen or something the previous week? But what was interesting was the performance of Jason Kelly. Most people. Would you know know Jason Kelly as a fine footballer? Would awfully over the years, and he's been on several New York teams, and he is a, an incredible amount of energy. But he also managed to land three very good points in that game. Uh, you know, a dual. We don't have that many dual players here anymore, but he cer- he certainly uh, played his part as uh, as a hurler for uh, Westmead. And of course, uh, Limerick were involved in the hurling this year, Frank. And there was a lot of a lot of. Uh, homegrown players on that front as well. So it's not just the football that is churning out the, the homegrown talent. No, I, I, I think New York are heading in the right direction. And that's principally uh, developing the underage talent with a development officer for hurling and a development officer for football. And that, uh, you know, that these young players will not just acquire the game uh, by association with their parents or their friends, but that they will be inculcated into the game, acquire the proper skills, and then be able to compete. Uh, the fact that uh, New York sends, uh, well, of course, couldn't send a team this year to fail, a hurling team, uh, which is, I think that's definitely a step in the right direction because hurling for a lot of years here has been ignored and uh, there's certainly a revival on when you see six teams participating in hurling this year. I caught up with Paul Lachnan this week to discuss Hoboken's historic win in clinching three in a row. I'm happy to have uh, Paul Lachnan, a.k.a. Dumper, back on the podcast, a return podcast, after successfully steering Hoboken to three in a row last Sunday, three in a row senior hurling championships in New York. Uh, Dumper, congratulations. Thanks a minute. It's great. Uh, you ran out the door Sunday. I couldn't get a hold of you. So uh, here we are now on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, that's as good as any now. <laughs> so, t- so tell me, don't worry. It was a, it was a great game. It was, you know, a ding dong battle back and forth. Um, you lost uh, an important man there. Paul Garden went off there going into the third quarter, I think it was. And then there was a bit of a comeback uh, by Tipperary. It looked like the edge did, but um, I think he decided to throw Paul back on and he had a big influence in the game. That's right, yeah. So I I think in the third quarter, Tip probably outscored us about 12 points to two or close enough to that. And then they went ahead by maybe three points. And uh, the lads in the line decided to bring Paul Gordon back in, even though he had a pulled hamstring, but just told him to sit on the edge of the square. Um, So one one, one ball and hand passed it to... Dara Walsh, I think Dara was blocked or hooked. Um, but then right in the last two minutes, ball came in, he flicked it over his own head, Dara ran onto it and, and put it in the in the net then for the last last score of the game. So it's a win win by three points. Yeah. yeah, I saw him limping back on and we were in the press box yeah. and we were thinking, What is going on here? And uh, I think one ball came into him and uh, he might have got a touch on it, but it got nowhere, but you could see his physical presence was even injured, was uh, having an impact. And then that ball came into him and the flick on a deft touch and into Dara Walsh and he buried it home. I think Dara got 2-9 on the day. 2-9, yeah. That's what we were actually topping it up earlier today. That's what I believe he got, yeah. So he was a main, our main man <laughs> on the day, without doubt. Yeah. So, Paul, what's your role with Hoboken? Were you, you came on as well, of course, um, in the second half. Are you manager, player manager? How, how, do, you, how um, do you work it? We're an unusual club, like we kind of have a mixed, mixed sh- shared roles, really. But I'd be jack of all trades, really. Um, but mo- most of the work on the line was done by um, Johnny Glynn and John Fitz this year, um, Pat Egan as well, so and Charlie Thompson as well, who's our chairman. Okay. But uh, yeah, I came in there second half, but the, the work was most of the work was done at that stage, so. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, Brian Glynn, of course, was captain and he gave it all in that game because he went limped off injured in the senior football final about five minutes into the game. <laughs> That's right. We were well, Secretly, I was very happy that he was playing with us before he was playing the football, to be honest. 
because they got the most out of him. But I'd say he started cramping up there. He's 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 after putting in a big shift there in our game. So it's tough, very tough to go and play two yeah. senior finals back to back. You know, so absolutely. And I saw Peter Hatzer there as well. We played in the Ulster game, and he came on with about five minutes, actually five minutes into the senior football final as well for for Barnabas, and uh, he got a point. So uh, a lot of demands on a couple of players that Sunday. That's right, yeah. A lot of busy, busy schedules for some of the players, yeah. That's right. He scored a great point, actually, at the left. Timmy Dumper, um, so Hoboken, it was, it was your first ever three in a row. It was your first time winning three, three counties in New York. So you're a relatively new club, aren't you? Formed a couple of years. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, I see 1892 or something on the crest, do I? Oh, that, that was, um, <laughs> I don't know where that came out of. <laughs> I think it was, um, I think it was got to do with um, Ken Mayer guards or Hoboken guards and they thought to link it in some way to, to that. But All right. From from my from my understanding, it was founded in 2011 by um, David Cosgrove, um, Connor Costigan, and Declan Hogan. Three three people from Hoboken. So okay, um, well, two of them are from Tip, and one of them is Irish American. Um, yeah, so. and you're a Galway man yourself, of course. Galway man, yeah. Yeah, because I was looking at, I was talking to Frank last week in the preview, and he was saying that uh, we were just saying that Hoboken's a new club. And I was there sitting, I, I was looking at the program Sunday, and it said 18, some 1892. Oh, and I was like, what's going on here? 10 years now, 10 summers, yeah. and that's about it. So, yeah. So, you were telling me, so what we, a lot of you were playing with Tipperary before, and Tipperary won a couple of counties there back in uh, 2015, 2016, I think. And uh, some of you were drafting up from Hoboken. So tell me how it came to pass that you were, that you kind of, some of you made the shift over to Hoboken. So for a good few years, a lot of us were drafting from, let's say, Hoboken Junior up to Tipperary Senior. Um, and then in, we won, won with Tip in 2015 and 16. Um, but then Hoboken won the Junior in 2017. So the following year, 2018, both Hoboken and Tip were senior. So a lot of us, could no longer draft up the tip. We had to play against tip, so we played played with Hoboken, and that was our first, I guess, first year ever playing against each other, 2018. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you've had a few battles with them, of course, in the last couple of years. So you know each other fairly well. Yeah, it's always been a it's been a very close battle. Um, this year and last year has only been a puck of a ball, and really came down to the last minutes of the game. So it's always been very very close. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, tell me, how hard was it to train and get fellas together this year with COVID at the start of the year? And uh, where where do you train? Um, so a lot of people, for, for a while there, we thought there was going to be no hurling or no GA. Um, and people were, were, I guess, upset about it, the same as anyone would be. Um, but then it was announced that they're going to try and go ahead with the championship um, this year. So we were, like, most people, we asked, I asked all around the, the panel and everyone was interested in playing. Um, because yeah. they've been locked down for for months, and any kind of exercise, any kind of sport was was on their mind. So everyone kind of committed to it, and we probably got a better commitment this year than I've ever seen in trainings, because people are just locked up for too long. Um, and we train in Randall's Island, so you usually grab a pitch out there. But training was was consistent and good now for for I guess we had two two and a half months really of it. Was all we get, but it worked. So and are there a lot of you um, living in Hoboken? Um, not really. I'd say there's, there's a few of us in Hoboken, a few of us in Jersey City, um, good few in Manhattan, and then a few in Queens. That's kind of our main, uh, maybe maybe one or two in up up in uh, Woodlawn, but most of it is Manhattan and Jersey, really. Yeah. And where's the bulk of the the squad from back home in Ireland in terms of counties? Jeez, I've seen, a, I've seen the Clare lads always seem to want to take pictures with each other after a game. So it <laughs> seems to be a good line-up of them. Probably five or six of them. There's probably three or four Galway lads, a few Wexford lads. Um, yeah, a few, that's mostly what's better. One, or, one tip lad. Um, yeah, that's most of it. Okay. Yeah, else, yeah. I mean, oh, one Kilkenny lad, one, yeah, one Kilkenny lad as well. So. Okay. And how how did the championship go this year? Obviously, you won it, like. But what was it in terms of competitiveness? Um, there was a you were playing a couple of the it was Ulster West Mead and Limerick, and then uh, you played off the final, was it? Yeah. So everyone was to play each other once, and then the top three would be in a senior championship, and the bottom three would be in a junior championship. 
But the top three, we'll say us, after the, all, all the games, was us, Tip and Waterford, and there wasn't much between any of us. Um, so uh, any of the games, like Tip were ahead, Waterford were ahead, um, it just came down usually to the last 15 minutes in each game. So it was, it was quite evenly matched, I thought, this year, between those three, you know. So. Okay. And so what's the... Were you uh, at full... At full um... Full force last Sunday, were you short any players or did you have a full squad going into the game? We had um, we had a few lads that retired this year, um, but they were still still in, in this country. And then we had one guy, um, Darren O'Connor, he brought, I think he fractured his leg in, in the Waterford game. So he was on the Ooh. line in, in, a, in crutches, yeah. So he was a big loss, but a, good, a great, great lad as well. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in terms of hurling and playing on the... That, that pitch up in Gaelic Park uh, compared to playing on a uh, grass surface, how do you find it? In the fr- um, it's great as long as you don't fall on it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, <laughs> know, that, I know that myself, yeah. <laughs> it's it, it faster. It's definitely faster. Um, it's, the ball bounces. You know, you can predict the, ball, you can predict the bounce. And it's probably, it's probably better, better to watch and better to play in, in the speed of it. But it's unforgiving in, on, on the joints and on the legs that you do fall on. Yeah. Yeah. But it probably makes it easier for a forward than a, if you're fast. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the downside. <laughs> yeah. I got a few scraped knees last year and uh, yeah. stuck to the sheets. Then at, at night, it's, it's yeah. no joke. It's, it's a burn. It's a burn, really. Like it's that's what the injury is. Yeah. yeah. So what's the plan for going forward now? Um, will you, will you have a much turnover in players next year, or what's the what's the outlook? Um, for the most part, like a, a lot of our panel is, is, is people that have been here for a good few years like so even from even from 2018 I'd say we probably have a good 10 bodies still playing like you have yeah. Brian Glynn, Paul Gordon, Killian, McNamara, Podge Morris, Eamon Glynn, Jim Taher, Darren O'Connor, James Egan, Pat Egan, Stephen Power they're all they've all been playing, playing the last three years and hopeful that they stay around as well you know so it's, it's good it's hope, hopefully now they stay around for the future. Yeah, and did you stick around for the the football games on the? Uh, stayed stayed for for a while, but we were kind of kept kept to the side there and celebrating as well. But no interest in that that foreign sport, I'd say. Uh, we were we were still reminiscing, I guess. But no, yeah. it was it was still good good quality football. Whatever we did see, yeah. Uh, as as a year as a year goes, it's been a successful from a, just a GA hurling standpoint and football standpoint. It's been a successful year, I think. And I just more so because you have. Just people that are living here full time playing, and you don't have that, you know, the, the people coming in and out of it like that mightn't be around yeah. full time. But it's, it's lads that have adopted adopted their clubs here as their home clubs. You know. So, Do you think that there that you had a bigger commitment this year because of that? Because there was was that a factor that there was less sanctions I, or there was zero sanctions this year? Um, I think it was just people for at one stage they thought they mightn't be able to play a sport this year. Yeah, and then. And then they're like, well, geez, now we actually have the chance to do it and let's really commit and enjoy it because it's only when you're <laughs> taken away from you. Yeah, you realize true, how yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. And then you had the, I guess, the combined, like with Les working from home and, and maybe not, not commuting from other states might allow them to go to do more trainings, you know? Yeah. And not yeah. working, not work, work, you know, the more flexible work hours. Oh, uh, yeah, of so, course. Yeah, yeah. So, so lads, lads are probably able to work. A full day at home, start early or finish maybe a small bit early to go training. Whereas before they might be driving from um, Connecticut back down or from out in Jersey back back into the city, you know. We finish off the podcast by looking at the remaining games in this year's New York GA calendar, which includes the Junior A and B football finals, as well as the Ladies Football Championship. The season isn't over yet. Of course, we've got the Junior A and Junior B football finals to go. Uh, I think there's one down for this Sunday and possibly next Sunday, and we've the Ladies Football, so it's, uh, it's not all done and dusted yet. No, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, the, uh, the Junior A, uh, I, I, I think uh, I predicted Kerry... Uh, that uh, will win that. Uh, they may be playing uh, Barnabas, but I think Barnabas uh, may have lost a few players as from last Sunday because if you're bumped up to play a senior and uh, you haven't been a drafted player, you, you, you are not able to go back down. But uh, Kerry looked to have a very formidable squad at the moment in Gary, o- Gary O'Driscoll, uh, Dave Colhan, ne- Neil Maydean, uh, Keith Quinn, and um, GM Smith, 
and uh, Red, Red Montana and Keelan Hickey. These are all uh, bona fide senior players. And uh, I think Kerry should be a senior football team, not a junior A team. And uh, I think Barnabas uh, will have their work cut out with them because I said they lost a few players as a result of them being bumped up uh, to play senior. And in the, uh, the uh, junior B, I think it's Shannon Gales. I'd still pick Shannon Gales too. Uh, uh, I think they may be playing um, um, Rangers, and Rangers have some very, very good players, but I don't think they have enough to upset Shannon Gales at this stage. Okay. And uh, Frank, finally, what, in the terms of the ladies' football, what, what, what's, uh, what's the latest there? Well, they, they're, they're, um, I, I just came from a ladies' uh, game this evening uh, with Kerry Donny, Donegal playing Rockland. And uh, from what I can see at the moment, uh, Kerry Donegal would have their eyes uh, firmly planted on lifting the silverware this year. They're a very experienced team. They have been in finals, won finals, and I would be giving them the nod to... Uh, pick up whatever they call it. I don't know if they've changed the name of the trophy this year or not. So, Okay. And is there a good couple of teams uh, lining up with the ladies this year? Yes, yes. There they're, they're, they're are eight teams all together. And oh, of course, right. the Fela the fail, the fail team uh, participates and gets them very valuable experience. There, There's Manhattan Gales. There's uh, uh, the new team out in Queens, uh, O'Don- O'Donovan Rossa. And there's Leitrim and uh, St. Bridget's. And they're, all the games have been quite competitive, but it looks to me as if, as if uh, Kerry Donegal are the, uh, probably the strongest team at the moment. Okay, perfect. So all looking good. So, Frank, uh, nearly there. Where we almost didn't have anything at the start of the year, but uh, it's, uh, we're getting in spades now. So uh, all, all looking good. All is looking very good. I, I think the uh, New York GA should be very proud of their accomplishments this year. Uh, because there, there were a, a lot of pessimism early on as to how the, the season would, would pan out. And so far, we've had four finals in, in men's football and they have all had and, and hurling and they've all been great, very competitive, exhilarating. And I think the other two will be the same. And uh, the ladies' football has been quite exciting too. So, Okay. Thanks a million, Frank. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. We're, we're, we're nearly there. <laughs> All right, Mike. Take care. <laughs> Thanks a million. You're welcome. And that's all for this week's podcast. Don't forget to check out some of our previous GA podcasts with Cork football legend Larry Tompkins, Dublin footballer Jack McCaffrey, former Galway hurler Johnny Glynn, and former Kerry County board chairman Pat the Bag O'Sullivan on his thoughts on the New York GA scene. Keep up to date with the latest New York Championship match reports by buying a copy of the Irish Voice or Irish Echo or else log on to irishcentral.com. And don't forget to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter at The Long Haul Podcast. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka? And when we got to Bleecker Street, we stopped at 44. Our mother and her sisters there to meet her at the door to me away. You Santi, my dear Annie. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the